Thank you for joining our Debbie Strain Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Hospice Basics and the Benefits of Hospice and is the 10th in a series of 12 monthly webinars. I'm Mary Margaret Kilmeyer and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm the Program Director for Debbie Strain Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. My clinical and research background is focused on working as part of a collaborative team with the doctors, the patients, their families, and all of the members of their healthcare team. We would like to thank all of our sponsors today. Our title sponsors are Boston Biomedical and EMD Serono, as well as our platinum sponsor, Lily Oncology, for providing the funding to make this webinar possible. You'll be able to ask questions all throughout this presentation. However, we will be addressing them at the end of the presentation, but feel free to type your questions into the text box that appears as part of your webinar screen. As I had mentioned, we'll address all of the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. In addition, we're also recording this webinar today, and the recording will be accessible on the lecture library of our website. First, I will be sharing some information information about our president and founder, Debbie Zellman, as well as the organization, Debbie Stream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer, known as DDF. Then we'll hear a presentation on the hospice basics and benefits from Shirley Timothy Paul of Vetus Healthcare. And the presentation will be followed by and concluded with the, the question and answer session. Pictured here is our president and founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer, Debbie Zellman. Debbie was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. A practicing attorney and a mother of three, she had no risk factors for stomach cancer and her symptoms were very vague. And at the time she was told that her chance of being alive in five years was only 4%. She's endured many harsh chemo regimens over the years, as well as targeted treatments and radiation therapy, and she's experienced many recurrences and is still a patient to this day. Debbie founded DDF in April of 2009. As an organization, we're a member of several advocacy coalitions, including the Deadliest Cancers Coalition, Patient Equal Access Coalition, the State Patient Equal Access Coalition, as well as One Voice Against Cancer. Debbie is an individual and patient also serves as an advocate on numerous committees and task forces. Many of you are familiar with the facts and statistics about stomach cancer, and we work to update these uh, on our website as more information comes to light and becomes available to us. In 2017, it was estimated that more than 28,000 Americans will be diagnosed with stomach cancer and more than 11,000 will die. Eighty percent of all of the patients in the United States are diagnosed at stage four when the relative five-year survival rate is only five percent. And incidence rates in younger populations continues to increase and yet the in overall frequency is on the decline and still, despite these statistics, many know very little about this deadly disease. Debbie's Dream Foundation is dedicated to raising awareness about stomach cancer, advancing funding for research, and providing education and support internationally to our patients, families, and caregivers. It is our ultimate goal to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can learn more about our organization and our mission by visiting our website at www.debbystream.org. In our few short years of existence, DDF has achieved many great milestones. We have 25 chapters across the United States, as well as chapters in Canada and in Germany. And our events are ongoing around the country throughout the year. Our patient resource education program helps patients and their families and caregivers around the world by matching them with survivors and caregivers using disease-specific criteria, including their staging, their biomarker, their location, and specific demographic and personal information mm -hmm. to the best of our ability. We also host wet educational webinars, like the one that you're listening to today, as well as year-round symposia. And our website contains in-depth information about stomach cancer that can be translated into more than 60 languages by locating the translate icon at the bottom right of every page. 
We have also provided $650,000 in research grants, as well as advocated during our annual Capitol Hill Advocacy Day each year to add stomach cancer to the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. And based solely on this effort, nearly $18 million has been awarded to stomach cancer researchers over the last three fiscal years. Here you can see a quick snapshot of our homepage, and there are numerous links at the above the blue bar. We'll have drop-down menus to access information and support, uh, ways to take action, our upcoming events, and so much more. So please visit our website to learn more about the information available there. And a few events that are listed that are coming up, but I would like to just make note that the month of November is dedicated to stomach cancer. And here at Debbie's Dream Foundation, we dedicate and call this month Curing Stomach Cancer Month. You can see our website's advocacy page for more information about Curing Stomach Cancer Month and how to declare this in your state. So for more information about these and any events that are going on around the country for this month, please visit our website and click on that events tab. DDF is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And also on this slide, you will see important phone numbers and email addresses that you can utilize at any time to contact our office and our staff. And so we'll begin the presentation made possible in part by our title sponsors, Boston Biomedical and EMD Serono. The topic this month is hospice basics and benefits. Our speaker is Shirley Timothy Paul of Vita's Healthcare. As a Vita's community educator and home health liaison, Shirley combines her knowledge of health and her nursing experience to educate people of all faiths and all backgrounds about hospice and end of life issues. Shirley has nearly 20 years of experience as a nurse and educator specializing in critical care. She's joined the Vita's Health Care team in 2013 as an admissions nurse and transferred to her current role as a community educator in 2016. We're so thankful for her uh, for joining us today. And now, Shirley, I will turn the webinar over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thank you all for giving me this opportunity. And um, I'd like to start by saying that in all these 20 years or 15 years prior, I thought I had a knowledge of hospice services, but it, it's surprising just how much um, even healthcare professionals don't know about what hospice provides. And oftentimes we tend to stick with the myths or what we knew about hospice years ago. And because of that, it is important for us to share with the community exactly what it is that we provide so that people can take the opportunity and um, get the services that they need at the time that they need them. Um, if we can start on this first slide, which that begins with goals. The goal of our education is uh, to educate nurses and other healthcare nurses, as well as the community on, benef um, on basics and the benefits for the patient and the family. Next slide. The objectives, describe the history and philosophy of hospice, the list two or more criteria used to identify hospice appropriate patients, identify the difference between curative and palliative care, explain Medicare and reimbursement for hospice, and discuss the relevance of advanced directives in DNR when discussing hospice services. Next slide. Um, as sad as it is to say, all of us will die. You know, 10% die suddenly and unexpectedly like events like heart attacks, car crashes, but the other 90%, which is the majority of us, um, live quite long. And unfortunately, we find ourselves sometimes um, dealing with illness. Predictable, predictable, I'm sorry, steady decline with relatively short, which means terminal. Um, there's a difference between terminal and chronic illness, and sometimes people hear hospice and immediately assume that, okay, this person must be dying. You do not have to be actively dying to be on hospice services. Um, there are a number of, of assessments that are made prior to someone meeting criteria to be on the hospice program. Next slide. 3% of America's population is greater than 65. 
Back in the 19th century, life expectancy was 45 to 50, and most people died at home. But now, people are living well into their hundreds, people are healthier, people are finding different ways to maintain their health, but still, at some point, we do begin to decline. And at that point, we need to be provided the care that we need. We need to understand that death, depending upon when it comes, it's still a natural process. And what we're finding now is that because of the lack of understanding of a program like ours, people tend to miss out on the opportunity of receiving the kind of care that they need at that time. Approximately 75% of Americans die in the healthcare facilities, and we find that a lot. My history is mostly in critical care, and even as a critical care nurse, I had no clue what hospice had to offer. We would have patients on um, a multitude of medications, on life support, and when that patient became imminent, that's the time when we would call hospice. But having now been educated on hospice services, I've come to realize that oftentimes we weren't doing that person a service. People, um, nine out of 10 physicians would rather die at home than to die on, um, in intensive care units or in the hospital. People are usually shocked by that statistic, but it's because they know the difference and they, they know that at that time they want to be surrounded by family and to maintain comfort. And that's what hospice can offer. It can ho offer the comfort that is required, the quality of life, the support. Next slide. History of hospice. I'm at the, I'm on the slide, I'm sorry, history of hospice. Hospice derives from the word, um, from root words such as hospital, hospitality, shelter, respite, and caring. It began um, in Europe with, by a, a nurse and a chaplain. And what they were finding back then is the number of people were coming from the war or indigent and they had no place to go and were dying unfortunately on the street. So they developed this program where they would take the patients in and provide them care so that they can die in dignity. Next slide. Still under hospice history. 1969, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and if we have any nurses um, or educators, they would be familiar with that name. I'm sorry, with that name. Um, she wrote a lot about death and dying, and she brought more light to the actual natural processes of death and dying, whether it's physical or physiological. In 1974, you had New Haven Hospice of Connecticut, and in 1976, VTOS began. Now, this is over 30 years ago, but our program has actually grown quite a bit. We're national. Um, we provide care in a number of states. In um, 1978, National Hospice Organization was developed, and their mission is to lead and mobilize social change for improved care at the end of life. Next slide, CTOS beginnings. Okay, available for all who need it in the location of their choice. Home could be anywhere. Home is wherever you call home. If a patient is actually in their physical home, we provide care there. If the patient is at a nursing home, we provide care there. Um, or an assisted living facility, wherever the patient goes, we'll follow them to provide the care that they need. Patients and families can and will teach us what they need and determine. I, at the time that I was practicing at an admission, as an admissions nurse, one of the questions I would ask during the evaluation is what is it that the family is needing at that moment? And that varies from person to person. Sometimes you'll find that caretakers are overwhelmed. Sometimes the patient just want their symptoms to be managed. Sometimes they just want to be home. And oftentimes they're afraid because they hear the term hospice and sometimes it's actually quite difficult to even get the conversation started because they become fixated on the term hospice, hospice, and everyone you ask will associate the word hospice with death. However, we need to come back to looking at what will that death process be like? Will that person be at the hospital attached to a number of IVs and on life support until their very death? Or will that person decide, no, at this point, it is clear that I'm imminent. I'd like my family to be around. I'd like decisions to be made. I'd like to be comfortable. 
free of pain, not short of breath, a number of things. And that's what we can offer. Next slide. What is palliative care? The study and management of patients with active, progressive, far advanced disease for whom the prognosis is limited and the focus of care is quality of life. Now, palliative care as well as hospice seem to appear to go hand in hand. But when you come to that point where the individual just does not want to close off any opportunity of life prolonging um, machinery or medication, we suggest palliative care until they're ready to make that decision. Under palliative care, we provide relief from pain and other symptoms, a firm life in regards dying as a normal process, very similar to hospice. We neither hasten or postpone death, integrate the physiological and spiritual aspects of care, provide support for the patient and family. And this is extremely important. While we try to do our best in the hospital system, oftentimes with mechanics of caring for a number of patients at one time or the, the basic in and out of how critical care um, units work where you're constantly on the move, sometimes families don't get the support that they need. And although we want to do that, we can't do it in certain um, where certain treatments are being made. So that is something that needs to be considered when uh, a family really feels that at this point, they need all the support that they can get. Uh, we use a team approach to address needs, will enhance quality of life and may also positively influence the course of the illness, is applicable early in the course of the, of the illness and in conjunction with other therapies. Um, you'll find that patients and families sometimes don't communicate well when they're dealing with the stress of the chronic illness. And that involves fear, it involves um, grief. And this is a time where it's extremely important that conversations are met. You know, I've had cases where patients will try to keep information away from their family about the, prog um, about the current prognosis or the, um, where they are in their illness. Uh, if in fact they are dying or actively dying. And then the same family is trying to keep that information from the patient. So you basically have a disconnect in communication where everyone's trying to protect one another and missing out on valuable time because certain conversations are too difficult to open up. Next slide. Curative versus palliative care. We're in the Western area where curative, the curative is our main focus. We have to try to beat it. We have to try to cure everything. But in actuality, sometimes we can't. So we, on the curative, it's disease-driven. The doctor is in charge. Disease, the disease process is primary with minimal choices. You've been diagnosed. This is what we're going to do. Um, we're going to do is we're going to treat, 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 and eventually we'll come up with a result. On the palliative, it's symptom driven, where our main focus is to keep, maintain that patient's comfort. We want the person to be able to function to the highest ability that their body would allow. We want the patient to remain in charge. And we know that, yes, at, finally the patient has to make the decision whether it's to sign consent for treatment, to sign consent for, let's say, it was chemotherapy or continue with di diagnostics. But under palliative, the patient has already made a decision that there are certain curative measures that they no longer want. Um, they do not want to be getting stuck with um, needles early in the morning or being awakened to ask if they're in pain or to have um, CAT scans over and over again, although the, the end result appears to be the same. The disease process is secondary. The, the patient is primary. The person, the individual is primary. Does, has this worked? Are you comfortable? What can we do? Let's come up with a different plan to see how we can maintain that comfort. Many choices are given and the patient remains in control. Comfort and quality of life is also maintained. You have individuals that, that have now made the decision to come on to a palliative or hospice service that are now although still ill, but 
comfortable enough to be able to either travel, visit with family, have family over, um, maintain it, or, or help with the regimen so they can take the medications when they feel that they actually need them, as opposed to a more ritualistic type scheduled uh, regimen that are given in the hospital. Next slide. Patient appropriateness. This is very important. One of the myths in hospice, again, is that if, they're, if you're on the program, you have to be actively dying. And that is um, certainly not the case. You have life-limiting illness. Medicare regulations uh, state that the patient has to show a diagnosis, I'm sorry, of six months or less in prognosis. Two physicians have to agree. And the patient and or family, patient and or family request. Now, when the person is evaluated for hospice services, there, we do determine by assessing the patient's situation, whether the patient is declining, whether um, the patient has a terminally or chronic illness. And if that patient has shown that they've met criteria to decline, where they're no longer able to do some of the things that they were doing before, where um, in the last few months they've, they've gradually become dependent, they may meet criteria. Simply having a certain diagnosis does not mean that you meet criteria for hospice, and being on hospice doesn't necessarily mean that you will pass away in six months. Shockingly, we find that most patients that are assigned on to hospice tend to live longer because emotionally they're, they're doing better physically because their pain and or other symptoms are now under control. Next slide. These are some examples of oncology diagnoses, such as uh, breast cancer, bone, renal cancer, pancreatic, bladder cancer, malignant melanoma, lung cancer, colon cancer, advanced prostate cancer with metastasis, head and neck cancer. End stage, I'm sorry, next slide. End stage cardiac, pulmonary, Alzheimer's disease, renal disease, liver, stroke, Lou Gehrig's disease, AIDS. These are some of the diagnoses that patients have um, on hospice. Next slide. Disease progression, change or decline in performance status, loss of appetite, excessive weight loss, difficulty breathing, pain. Next slide. End of life symptoms, unrelieved pain, confusion, with restlessness, weight loss, shortness of breath, disturbed bladder and bowel function, disrupted sleep, nausea and vomiting. These are examples of symptoms um, that patients have while uh, prior to, be, to coming on to hospice or end of life symptoms. Next slide. Additional symptoms, psychosocial, depression, anxiety, Ineffective coping and communication, we just mentioned that earlier, where people have difficulty having tough um, discussions once they are now dealing with, uh, with a decline. Life role transition. If you're a parent and you've uh, just been diagnosed with a terminal illness and now you have family members that are providing the care for you or your children, that is a huge change of uh, caregiver distress spiritual. You have despair, hopelessness, isolation, power, powerlessness, loneliness. You have a number of elderly individuals that have been diagnosed with chronic or terminal illness, and they don't have anyone, and they feel that they're all alone in the process. However, hospice is here for that, which is ours can offer you the visits that you need, the support that you need. The need for reconciliation. Now, again, depending upon culture, family structure, dynamics, sometimes people do not have those conversations that they need to have at the time that they need to have them. And the worst thing is to be caught in a situation where illness has come to play and you really don't know what to do. Making decisions under distress is horrible. That's why we have to be more educated as to what we need at the time that we need them. Next slide. After the end of life. Hospice provides care for the family after the patient dies via bereavement services. Now, oftentimes when families are dealt with poor prognoses or terminal illness unexpectedly, 
even when they have been dealing with it for quite some time, you'll have people try to stay strong for the purpose of the patient not having to concern themselves, but it does take on a toll where now that you're in a situation, you feel that you're overwhelmed. It could be because of direct, direct care that you're providing to the patient. It could be finances. It could be that there's a lot that's left to be said, but you haven't been able to do so. For at least one year following the death of a patient, hospice offers letters, cards, phone calls, visits. You have spiritual support. You have memorial services and other forms of support that show that we haven't forgotten, that we know that the individuals providing the care, the caretakers, the caregivers, are going through a time that is extremely stressful and they will need the support. One of the um, groups that I find the most difficult are the children. And although people say 18 year olds are now adults, children, um, I personally have a 19 year old who has made it clear that if I'm terminally ill and, um, and I require care that she will not be capable of signing any forms to remove that support at that time. So I decided she will not be my health care giver. I'm sorry, health care surrogate. Why? It's because most of us want to be comfortable um, if we've re reached a point where our body has given up. Most of us want to be surrounded by the people we love. But that doesn't happen because we're not aware of what's out there, what services are out there to help us to, to maintain that quality of life. Next slide. Hospice is an interdisciplinary team. You have the patient and family, which is on top, which are the primary decision makers, the attending physician, the hospice physician and medical director, the registered nurse, the hospice aide, the social worker, the chaplain, and volunteers. Now that team provides the care around the clock, meaning that you have access, the physician comes out to the home, wherever home is, to assess the patient. They can be contacted for any decisions that need to be made, whether it's for the, the medical regimen or perhaps the patient is at a point where we may need to transfer the patient to an inpatient unit so that we can resolve a symptom that has developed, couldn't resolve at home. Examples would be pain that just cannot seem to be controlled or vomiting, it could be diarrhea. It could be a number of things that at home we would not have enough um, support to provide that care. But after supporting that patient and resolving that uh, symptom, they go right back to where home is. You need social workers because they have the information that you'd need if you need additional support. Sometimes people have financial issues that develop, and that's oftentimes and they would need some support in terms of getting uh, some, for example, partnering with Meals on Wheels, getting them to come and provide the meals that the patient needs. Uh, a social worker may be able to get additional assistance um, with hours of visits. You know, we do come, we come in if the patient's on uh, primary care, you have people come in and visit, the aides come in and visit anywhere from three to five times a week. Perhaps that individual may need more and our social worker would be able to help us to identify those needs and identify where that support can be given. Next slide. Medicare hospice benefits. It was passed by Congress in 1982. Over 100% of costs related to the terminal diagnosis are met. And yes, I said 100%, including the medical equipment and the medications. And when we say uh, associated with the diagnosis, many people who are terminally ill or chronically ill have a number of comorbidities or another, a number of other um, disease processes that are going on. You could have someone with end-stage heart disease that happens to also have dementia. So that person is admitted under the cardiac um, illness and diagnosis, and everything associated with that would be covered 100%. Unlimited benefit periods. After each six months, the patient is evaluated and we determine from how the patient is doing whether or not they still need criteria for hospice. And again, surprisingly, some patients 
at, after six months either improves or improves to such a point that they will graduate off of hospice. Services are primarily reimbursed on a per diem basis, meaning they are evaluated every, after each six months to, uh, to identify whether or not they still meet criteria. Next slide. Medicare covered services, skilled nursing services, physician visits, hospice aid visits, volunteer visits, medical social services, spiritual counseling, nutritional counseling, bereavement support for families. Um, others that are mentioned here, physical therapy, dialysis. They, there are a number of treatments that are available that um, people are unaware of, and that's why we're here to give some more information. There are four levels of, next slide, I apologize. There are four levels of hospice care. There's routine home care, continuous care and in inpatient, and respite care. Now with routine home care, you have the patient at home, wherever home is, they are visited by the primary nurse. And the aides will, prim will visit anywhere from three to five times a week, and even more depending upon what the, the, the patient's requirements are. They will be assisted with custodial cares where at, um, and assist, I'm sorry, with custodial care, sometimes the, the patient only requires minimal care where they only need some light cleaning, some light housekeeping, some errands to be run. Or it could be that the patient requires some assistance with getting up out of bed and helping the family to, to get that patient clean, sitting up in the chair if they're so debilitated or uh, or just to visit and identify whether there are any additional needs that are, met, that are needed. Continuous care is when a patient has symptoms that need to be managed. They are also at a point where they would require a nurse to be there either eight hours a day, 12 hours a day, or around the clock until they, they get more comfortable or, start, or they are back to their routine baseline. Now, with continuous care, the patient is assessed on a daily basis to identify whether or not they still need the nurse to be there. But um, continuous care is actually quite important. It, it's important for the patient and it's important for the family where you don't have that, that panic that you go through. You can be able to sleep because you know that someone is there watching your family member, um, assessing them, being able to help with the symptoms that they need to be managed. That, that is what we offer. In patient care, like the example I gave previously, if a patient is at a point where their symptom is just too serious to be managed at the home, we have in, inpatient facilities at um, varying hospitals and actually standalone facilities where we can have them transferred until that time, until um, that symptom is completely managed or until until we identify that, yes, indeed, the patient can't go back, can go back home and be safe. Respite, respite care, you'll, sometimes you'll find that families um, near break or there are other things that come up where they'll need to travel. And they can't travel because they don't have the support that they need to make sure that the patient is safe and the patient is well. Well, we offer assistance there where we can have the patient transferred to our facility for a few days, a couple of days, five days, two days, so that we can make sure that they're safe, provide the care, and that family member can go to that family event, that wedding, that job interview, or whatever it is that they would have to be away for some time. Next slide. We have um, ethic committees. We evaluate each patient, each case individually, identify if there may, may be some issues that need to be discuss, be it with family or the team, um, advanced directives. Uh, earlier, uh, part of the objectives were to bring to light how important advanced directives are. It is astonishing how many people do not have advanced directives, even and oftentimes healthcare providers. Knowing how important it is to be able to have control of how you pass away, how you deal with um, a situation when you cannot make a decision for yourself it is so important, it's imperative at now, while you you have the ability to make that decision that you share with individuals um, that you are close to, that you trust, what you would like to be done. 
it happens all the time where healthy individuals, young individuals, something happens or you have a diagnosis that came out of nowhere and have rendered you unable to speak up for yourself. And now you're trying to make decisions. Family members are trying to make decisions, brothers, sisters, spouses. And it creates chaos. Why? Because either people weren't aware of what you may have wanted or everyone is saying something differently. Families are torn apart. When this happens, you'll have families get to a point where years are going by and they won't speak to one another because decisions were made that some of them didn't agree with. And it's a, it's a sad thing because if you're that individual that does not want certain services or certain treatments if you are unable to speak up for yourself and it's happening to you anyway, you suffer and everyone else suffers. Um, I'm not sure if people are aware that if you have children and after the age of 18, they have not, um, they have not done the five wishes or, or signed forms that state that you are to make decisions for them. If they're away at college and something happens, God forbid, you will not be able to make decisions for them. It doesn't matter if you're the parent. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're a sibling, because they need to have had already written that you are the person that can be given the information and make decisions. And being a parent myself, having a 19-year-old and her second year at college, if something happened to her, I would want to be able to make those decisions. I would want to be able to get information, but you cannot because of our, that would be a violation of HIPAA. Do not resuscitate. Do not resuscitate means just that. If by some awful situation you were, your heart stopped, you have been fighting with this illness for some time and your body just said enough and everyone around you is panicking, terrified. They don't know what to do. You know, it, we've been taught to go ahead and do anything and do everything. And sometimes bringing that person back in the sense or having their heart beat while they are now tied to tons of machines and no, no longer able to communicate is a, is a mode of sufferance. We're doing something to someone's body that has already, the body has already decided to shut down. That body has already decided, okay, I can't do this anymore but we're prolonging something that is natural. And again, we are all going to go through it at some point, but how we go through it is up to us. Next slide. Next slide. I'm sorry, I'd already gone over the advanced directive. Um, hospice and advanced directives. Patients do not have to have advanced, advanced directives to receive hospice care. While you're on our program, we will make suggestions that you, just, you let us know what your decisions would be and to have all your forms complete, but it's not a requirement to be on the program. Hospice staff, as I said, will discuss the importance, and hospice also, we offer the training on advanced directives. Next slide. Next slide. Partner with hospice. Benefit from hospice rich history. No criteria used to identify hospice appropriate patients, which we went over. Ask, could the patient's quality of life be served by palliative, versus, um, palliative care versus curative care? Medicare hospice benefits cover 100% of the costs related to terminal diagnosis. These are things that most, most often people aren't, aren't aware of. Hospice educates patients and families on, hospice, on advanced directives and DNRs. Next slide. You matter because you are. You matter to the last moment of your life. And we will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. That was by Dame, Dame Cicely Saunders. Now, think about that. We matter. We matter, our decisions matter, our needs, our wants, and if we're not discussing them or we're just leaving all the decisions up to the physician, we're not doing ourselves any favors because we all want to die with dignity. Oftentimes, we, but not often, majority, 90% of people want to be at home, surrounded by family, people that love them so that they feel safe, 
in their transition so that they're comfortable. And it's a, it's a time where you can speak to one another if you're still able to say the things that you want to say, to forgive, to move on. Because there, there will be a time where, in fact, yes, the body will decide enough. I am open to questions right now. So if we can begin with that process. Yes, and, and thank you, Shirley, so much for taking the time to talk through you know, some of the basic information about hospice. I know it's, it's something that can be largely misunderstood, but also yes. is seen as a very delicate subject for, for us, um, for anyone not as a patient, but also for those who are facing a chronic or a terminal illness. So thank you so much for providing that informative uh, welcome. presentation. So I, I first have a question that came in. Um, if possible, I think this refers back to one of your earlier slides about appropriateness. Mm -hmm. It, mm -hmm. The question is, can you explain the process of evaluating performance status? When we first get the, the order, oh, and I must mention, if a person is at home, they do not require a physician's order for, for someone to come out and provide information about hospice. That, so that's the first thing. And in terms of the assessment, you have a registered nurse that comes out and we have an entire um, list that we go through where we measure the person's ability, their physical ability, their uh, medications. When it comes to physical, we ask questions such as, um, what were you able to do a few months ago? Are you able to get out of bed? Are you able to bathe yourself? Are you able to um, run certain errands? Are you able to sit in the chair and hold yourself up? There's a, a number of questions that can be asked during the assessment process. And it could, the decline could be something as simple as you are able to do chores at the home and now you're not based on a symptom that has developed. It could be you were able to get out of bed, but now you're not able to do so or able to shower without assistance but now you're not able to do so, or even eat, but now you need assistance to do so. So it's, there's a number of assessments of different ways to assess a person's physical ability. And, and it sounds like from your presentation um, that patient-centric approach may help define where that line is drawn? Yes. Okay. Um, Another question, and I actually have a follow-up question to this as well. Okay. Uh, another question that's come in is that I've heard that end-of-life transitions can be associated with certain experiences for the patient. So, for example, um, talking about a journey or traveling toward that period of end-of-life, is this something that you're able to talk about, or are you aware of how often this happens? I couldn't specify how often, but I can share a personal experience. Um, I have an 11 year old and during the process of having him, I had, uh, I went in, I don't want to say went in fine. I was basically weeks or days away from giving birth and I woke up one evening, I couldn't breathe. I was I just couldn't breathe. And there was just no sign previously to being, you know, that something was wrong. And I get to the hospital, sign my healthcare surrogate forms, and I selected a person that could make those decisions, which was a family member, but not my spouse, because she was more informed. She's a critical care nurse. And I ended up in a coma for just short of a month. And I can honestly say my family went through it, not me, because I didn't remember much. But during that time, I was, my family was told to take me off of life support to, you know, I am a, a organ donor. So they asked that, you know, we save more lives by allowing me to go through the process and they could save lives by taking my organs. I believe I was in my um, late twenties or early thirties. And all that I can remember clearly is that I went to another place and my mom was there who has been 
she's been dead now, I guess, 20 some, 21 years. And my aunt, who had also recently passed away from breast cancer, was also there. And we were in a field, and my mom and aunt were as young as they were. You know, they looked young. My mom had hair again. Everybody was just healthy. And we were in a field. I remember I was barefoot and talking about my nails and picking peas. And my mom said to me, you need to go back because they're calling you. I was up and now fighting because I had tubes all over, you know, everybody staring at me. I was cold. And, but then what it did for me after I had been gone through all that is it gave me a calm where now I'm not afraid to die because I know we go someplace else. And wherever we go, we're reunited with the people that we love and we're not, we're healthy. We're not in some dark place where, you know, where everything is awful and people are screaming and it just didn't happen that way for me. It, I was, my family was told I had one chance, one percent chance of survival. And if I did wake up, I'd be a vegetable and so on and so forth. So I do know that, and I know this, it's not something I think happened. I know it happened. Everything just seemed calm and beautiful. The stress was gone. The pain was gone. But I'm back. I mean, we can't say that medicine is 100% because I definitely made it through that. But in that process, what it brought me was a calm. And yes, indeed, you have people that say they see light, they hear music, that they had a discussion with a past loved one, which was something that I had, as well as a, a beautiful visual. So, yes, I, I ha I've heard it. I've seen, I've heard quite a bit. But in terms of how often this happens or if it happens to everybody, you know, we don't know, especially if the people don't wake up, you know. But yes, indeed, it happens quite often. That must have been, and it, it sounds like an incredibly powerful, you know, experience and, and mm -hmm. understanding for you personally. So thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that, that personal story. You're welcome. And I, I know that we have been replete with stories of pers of experiences for those who've had you know, some some close um, close calls as well. Um, in terms of my follow up question to that, and you had mentioned the Elizabeth Kubler Ross and the five mm -hmm. stages of death and dying, as well as the follow up to that, the five stages of on grief and grieving. Uh, mm -hmm. do, do hospice care facilities provide any education for not only patients but their families on on those stages or any other methods, um, through either through the bereavement counseling process or some other mechanism? Yes, we do, and thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, we do have a bereavement program as well as support groups. We hold these support groups all over the, the county, and I'm sorry, for the different programs. We have different support groups, whether it be specific to disease or grief or um, depression, dealing with the different stages of death. We provide them for specifically for the caregivers as well as the patient. When patients are going through these processes, everyone handles it differently. You have mothers that are in fear of how their children will be able to go on. You have um, spouses that are terrified that their, their wives or their husbands who had never been involved in the finances, if they will lose everything. There are tons of things that need to be discussed and you sometimes need that support in order to be able to vocalize some of your frustrations. And at the support groups, when you have other people who truly understand what you're going through, it makes it a lot easier. So definitely we have support groups and bereavement um, programs and grief counseling we offer a, a, a large amount of counseling. We believe that that's primary. It's very important to not only keep the patient comfortable and help them through the process, but to make the counseling available, to, to make the process, the transition, if not easier, more tolerable. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And unfortunately, we're out of time for questions. Um, today, but I again would like to thank you, Shirley, for joining us and sharing this information. We we greatly appreciate your expertise. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. And as you know, this webinar was brought to you today by 
Debbie Stream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. The recorded version of this webinar and our past webinars can be found on our lecture library of our website. We would like to again thank our sponsors who helped make this webinar possible. Our title sponsors, Boston Biomedical and EMD Serono, as well as our platinum sponsor, Lilly Oncology. As a reminder, please check our website and your calendars to join us for an event near you. Beyond the listing that's available there, there are many events that are still taking place in the month of November and for Curing Stomach Cancer Month. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. This concludes our 10th in a series of 12 webinars. Our next webinar is going to be held on December 29th at 12 noon Eastern Time. The role of bacteria and the development of stomach cancer, the risk factors and therapeutic options for prevention of disease will be the topic and title of that presentation. Again, that's December 29th at 12 noon Eastern Time. Again, to view any past recorded webinars, please visit our lecture library. And we always would love to hear your questions, your comments, and your feedback. So please send that to your comments to patient.resource at debbiestream.org. Thank you again for joining us today.